Hi, Chris Lysenik here, host of the Damn Right Podcast. Just a quick note before we get started to say that it would mean the world to me if you rated and subscribed to the podcast on your podcast platform of choice. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the Damn Right Podcast. In AVP's operational model for damn success, there are seven components. Yes, one is technology, the most commonly discussed aspect of DAM. However, I would argue that the most important component is people. First and foremost, DAM's value is in its ability to serve users. Additionally, what are processes, measurement, governance, continuous improvement, and technology without skilled and talented people behind them? The central component, and what I would argue is the second most important, is purpose. Purpose is the fuel that keeps those skilled and talented people focused and driven to produce results and impact. Today, I'm joined by Andrea Callis, a true pioneer in the field that brings humanity and purpose in abundance. Andrea's personal journey takes us from winding nitrate film in UCLA's quote-unquote dirty film and television archive, more on that later, to working on the cutting edge of digital asset management at Paramount Pictures, with stops along the way at DreamWorks, Discovery, and the British Film Institute. Andrea's background is not only fascinating, but offers a robust expression of digital asset management fully realized and evolved. You'll delight in hearing about Andrea's personal journey. But the reason I've asked Andrea to join me today is to talk about one of her latest ventures in which she's serving as project co-chair for the Academy Digital Preservation Forum, formed under the auspices of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. The mission of the forum in part reads, with the ascent of digital technology in the production, post-production, distribution, and exhibition of motion pictures, and the concomitant decline in photochemical cinematography and practical disappearance of film projection, we want to engage with those with the greatest stake and influence to ensure that digital preservation is successfully achieved. Filmmakers, studio executives, academy members, archivists, operations professionals, technologists, and other practitioners charged with implementing digital preservation. Join us as we grapple with questions around defining the entertainment industry today, the business side of digital preservation, and whether we should trust the entertainment industry to take on the challenge of preserving cultural heritage. And remember, damn right, because it's too important to get wrong. Andrea Callis, welcome to the Damn Right Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to talk to you, Chris. Yeah, I'd love to start just by having you tell us about your background and the path that you've taken to get to where you are today? Well, I think, you know, it really all starts with the UCLA Film and TV Archive. When I was in graduate school at UCLA, um, I saw a little post on a board, a job board, saying that there was work-study positions at the UCLA Film and TV Archive. And I had come to UCLA to the grad program there knowing about a film restoration that was just sort of beginning and knowing that the UCLA Film and TV Archive was there. So I was excited that it was easy to just get a, you know, a part-time job there while I was going to school. Um, and I remember I called and uh, Jerry Golden, who's a wonderful person, still working in the field, was the guy hiring. And he goes, you know, this job isn't, uh, it's not on the campus. It's out here in Hollywood, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a little dirty out here. And, and I was like, where do I sign? <laughs> And that time at the UCLA Film and TV Archive was uh, just pivotal for my career because it was, you know, there weren't programs then. There weren't programs in, in you know, moving image archiving at that point. Um, so there wasn't an option for me to go to grad school in that. Um, but in a way, I didn't have to because I had people like Bob Gitt, you know, who we used to nickname the Pope of Preservation. Mm. We had Martha Yee, who was incredibly important in figuring out how um, library science could be applied to moving image archiving. Um, literally, she was dealing with like early MARC cataloging software that was made for books. Yeah. So she was constantly figuring out how to put a square peg in a round hole for moving image materials. And Eddie Richmond, who was the curator of the archive at that point, who was really figuring out how you manage an archive, how you deal with that. And then and Bob Rosen, who was the head of the archive and really a visionary in so many ways in terms of how archives could really intervene in culture mm. um, in, a, in a significant way in history and the importance of that. Mm. So uh, to me, that was incredibly fortunate that I was there at that moment with people who were figuring it out 
and figuring out how moving image archiving could actually work. So uh, that's, you know, that made me really, in my opinion, made me a really good archival professional out of that experience working there. Um, so yeah, I, I started off as a work study student and my job was inspecting nitrate, nothing that a student would do now. Um, but it was great to me. I loved it, even though, you know, it was, you know, in these dirty vaults and opening cans and, you know, it was a little risky, but I got to look at all the cans and see like, what is that? What is, you know, what are these, what are these things? Why don't we know more about them? Like that curiosity, um, and the pleasure of archives, which is being near these assets. Uh, and I realized, uh, yep, I'm in it for the long term. This is, this is what I want. This is what and I want to do. It sounds like you had an all-star team of colleagues there to help you really learn the trade and, and understand uh, not just the technical stuff, but it sounds like also kind of the value. And they were willing to take a risk on me. They were willing to, you know, give me uh, sort of more risk. So I, I got offered a, a full-time job eventually there, um, you know, preserving newsreels which was an incre another incredible education because, yeah. you know, it was a small thing. It was you know, still figuring it out. So I had to do everything from, you know, uh, justifying why I would preserve one newsreel over an mm. another with, you know, a complex justification. Then I had to sit at a bench and wind through each newsreel and actually inspect and repair, take it to the lab, see it preserved, then gather all the information together for somebody to catalog yeah. it, you know? So I had to do the whole soup to nuts and that was a great, and the fact that I was just given the rope to do that and figure it out, obviously with everybody's support and help, but that they gave me that responsibility was, was, was just fantastic. So that was another great, you know, step. Yeah, forward. that's a great start. So where, where did you, what, what, what did your career look like after that? So um, after I preserved news series for a while, I worked within the UCLA Film and TV Archives Research and Study Center, and they had just opened it up. Um, and it was really the first time where, um, and a lot of archives were like this at this point, where it was fine to just preserve them and, you know, sort of keep the doors closed, but actually opening it up and providing people to, to have a place to actually research and watch and, you know, use the archives was relatively new. And we were on a, on a university campus where um, these materials could obviously be of great use to students, to researchers, to for classwork. So we opened up the research and study center, and there I really started. You know, and I already had an interest in um, in technology and, and computers because you know universities were some of the first to, to get computers. Mm. Um, you know, so we're talking about mid '80s, late yeah. '80s here, right? So early on. And uh, so I was already fascinated with them. And so, you know, the, the idea that we could use computers to, uh, to help with providing access to materials, that's carried, you'll see that carried through my entire career. And so we did this project where there was, there was a, a communications professor who had taped um, news materials off the air for mm. years. So he had decades of these materials. And the only thing that, you know, was there was like, CBS News on March 2nd, you know, that's all the information we had about what was on those yeah. recordings. So we did a project around, because we taped a lot of stuff all, around Kahneman Square. We did a project where we actually took the um, closed caption broadcast signal off the tapes and dumped them into a database mm. so that people could search over terms and things like that. And... Um, and that's something that's very common today, and see, we see that all the time. It's used in all sorts of different search technologies now. But that was early on that we were sort of— That was groundbreaking. It was big, yeah. So I did a presentation on that at the Association of Moving Image Archivists. Hopefully you're very uh -huh. familiar. Um, and uh, there was a, a woman who uh, named Karen Weber who had been part of EMEA for a while. And at that point in her career was working with um, the company CGI um, that made, you know, uh, you know, visual effects, software and hardware. And they were working with DreamWorks and they wanted to create a digital archive for animation. And uh, so she said, oh, this person has a kind of idea about how technology and archives could work together. 
let's, you know, let's recommend her for this, this job at DreamWorks. Oh, wow. um, and so that's, that's how that happened. That's how I went from UCLA to, to DreamWorks. And it was, that was another, <laughs> that had to be a pretty story. big cultural shift. That was, that was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I went from, yeah. Just sort of university to, uh, to Hollywood. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, it was, that was fascinating. Absolutely amazing. I mean, I was an archivist hired before there was anything to archive. Yeah. Right. That's, you know, um, and so helping create a digital archive from nothing for animation, um, was just was fantastic and i just you know i just spent my time getting to know all about animation which was fantastic to get to know and the complexities of that and getting to know the artists and how it worked and how animation worked and how the you know animation it was really sort of also almost production asset management yeah. right they needed an archive during production uh, but we were also figuring out how then to have these kind of off ramps from that into a more uh, you know, sort of long-term repository. Um, and also I was looking at collecting up actual physical materials, like all the backgrounds were painted, yeah. you know, so, and they're unbelievably beautiful, I bet. you know, works of art, making sure that we, you know, handled those wells and archived those well as well. And also in those early days of DreamWorks and it was, it, DreamWorks was going to be this huge studio, right? It yeah. was going to have, there was a music area, there was television, there was, so starting to actually become, go outside of animation and build an archive for all of those things. So um, so that was fantastic to be able to do that from scratch, from nothing, right? I bet. To build it out of nothing when things, and be ready when the materials actually came into our archive. Yeah. So, and, and, and be around just amazing technologists too because animation's always been on the forefront of certainly of entertainment technology you know they've always been the ones who have been out there first mm -hmm. figuring out file-based workflows figuring out you know um i mean you know great stuff like i remember you know we were going from physical ink and paint to uh digital ink and paint mm -hmm. right so that was being that was a transition that was happening while we were making a movie yeah which was amazing but one thing I remember so clearly was like when the, you know, with physical ink and paint, you had to keep a cap on the number of colors you would use mm. because you needed to have a set number of colors that everyone would consistently use. And you had to keep those paints the same color. Right. So you couldn't, you know, and all of a sudden with digital ink and paint, you could have this, you know, a whole, all sorts of different palettes that came out. And I remember the animators' heads kind of exploding a little bit, like, oh, wow, this is so different. You know, like, when technology was cool, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like, when technology was our friend, you know, it was really that era of, you know, the sort of expansiveness of how uh, it could support, you know, creativity. And so uh, that was so fun to be around. Was there any was there any production that you recall specifically while you were there that was in that transition point into yeah this, it was you know. the Prince of Egypt was the first big movie that we were working on okay and it's it's a beautiful beautiful film if you ever get a chance to watch it you know it's it's basically it's the Moses story it's a Ten Commandments story but in animation and um you know just uh, I think that was what I you know remember so fondly about it is just beauty of it and how how much artistry there was in it and watching that happen it didn't turn out to be the most you know the, the most popular of the early dreamworks animated films you know the, the shrek came along closely thereafter okay. that was a huge huge interesting moment. um interesting yeah but but prince of egypt was really a rallying point for everyone that worked there in the beginning and um, how, you know, because we were figuring out the entire pipeline, the workflow, everything as the movie was being made. So, wow. Um, wow. It, and, you know, the, it really bonded that group of people. We're still friends with a lot of those people to this day because yeah. it was such a unique, um, uh, you know, environment. And uh, what was great for me was, um, and I think for everyone there was, uh, you could talk to anyone. Uh, you could walk into anybody's office, any artist, any animator, any executive, anywhere, anytime. Um, and anybody would 
and everyone was really sort of collaborative. In fact, there were no titles. That was a big thing. Interesting. Really dream works. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was just great for somebody who was trying to just absorb as much information as I, possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I. Uh, it was a wonderful atmosphere for that. It's kind of it's kind of mind blowing to think about like at that point in time the difference in tools, infrastructure, co- like capabilities. Like it's pretty wild to think about that you were tackling beginning to tackle those challenges at that point in time. Uh, different world, different world from today. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, I still deal with some of the same issues today. Yeah. You know, right. just sort of. I think you know what. What archives and animation have in common is that they have to have a lot of structure, right? So Mm. um, that was where I could, you know, sort of find a common core, right? So when you build a pipeline for animation, you have to have a pretty strict file naming convention or, you know, for every sequence scene shot, Hmm. you know, it because everyone shares and collaborates, goes through a number of departments. So that tight structure is absolutely necessary for animation to, to work. Right. Um, and so that's very good for archives. Yeah, yeah, we like yeah. that. And digital know. asset management. In uh, we like structure because then we know what we're t- knowing we, what we have. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was an interesting, you know, meeting of the minds. I see that. I see that. And so where, from DreamWorks, what was the next uh, step in your career there? So one of the things I did at DreamWorks was we figured out, um, that, you know, even though the movie takes three years, people need access to materials during that, like marketing and consumer products and things like that. So these off-ramps we created from production into archives also had different approval steps and things like that. So that, and we actually built out um, an access portal for people that needed materials into the production. Okay. And, um, I gave another presentation at another association of moving image archivists con- conference about this concept of sort of in production archiving mm. and discovery saw that and they were interested in trying to expand on that because they had the same issue it was more around making both a, uh, a domestic and an international version of some of their big, big programs that that wasn't enough time for them to do that. So then I worked for Discovery for a little while, and we we did. We did that. We had actual video loggers on set logging some of the videotapes that were being at, at, directly after they were shot, yeah. um, put them into a system so that the international people could have access to those materials and create their show. Um, and And we were going to ramp that up a little further, and then the bubble burst, right? And so that that program was was sort of seen as a luxury rather than a, you know, a necessity. Um, and so discovery that, so I sort of moved away from that a little bit and I worked sort of with their stock footage group and things like that, but it wasn't the sort of cool program I was hoping to do, but we did some really great things. Like we, we actually had a really early digital dailies system where people could, you know, from, from their shoots, put this like postage stamp sized little video on the on the World Wide Web, so that executives could take a look at it. Um, we had all sorts of bandwidth constraints and problems with that, you know. But we did some really great stuff, just sort of experimenting with technology. And when you say the bubble burst, I take that to mean the dot com bust of the two, early two thousands. Yeah, the dot com. So yeah, yeah that was nascent stages of digital asset management as we know it today, right? That was the early. I remember coming out to Hollywood and doing the early digital asset management conferences at. Um, now I think it's a Lowe's. It was something else back then. But anyway, yeah, that was a very exciting time. Everybody was all, all psyched up about the possibilities. Yeah, and the and right, and some of the tools for digital asset management were starting to come out. Um, the video logger we used was was out there, and um, there were other tools that were just starting at that point. Um, so yeah, trying to understand where they were, you know, and, and they were really early, and they just had some functionality, but trying to work with them. It was an interesting yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so, so UCLA, DreamWorks, Discovery, or Discover. Discovery. Yeah. And then, not Discover, Dis- Discovery. Discover is a credit card. Uh, and, <laughs> and then what, what next? Then, um, then the British Film Institute. So then um, uh, I was just, you know, I 
I found out that the, you know, that, that was the, the position head of preservation was coming open and, um, and that there, that I might have a shot at it. And that was fascinating to me, right. To be able to work in such a huge archive, work in a European archive, work with an enormous collection. So that was an opportunity I, I didn't want to miss. So, um, after, you know, a long time of applying because I was American and it was a British job. Yeah. Da, 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 I finally, I, I, I got that position. And that was, that was an incredible, um, you know, that was like a, so here I was with all this high tech stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and I go over to the BFI and it's like, Oh, okay. I'm going to go back a couple decades here. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's a film lab, very analog. Yeah. There's not much digital, anything going on. Um, and so that was really my job was to transform from analog to digital, okay. an entire conservation center. Wow. Um, and, um, and that was great too. It was wonderful. It was, there were so many great colleagues to work with and trying to figure out how to manage things and even retraining people and, you know, cause people weren't even, they weren't even scanning film yet. Yeah. Right. We had to get a film. Scan. It, it, it was all photochemical and, um, but it it also brought got me back to my experience from UCLA because I had to deal with photochemical film and photochemical preservation. So that it was a great way of, and also I really loved getting back with with film too. I have a you know connection to movies. I think a little bit more than I do to TV. Um, but even though I love TV, I work with TV. <laughs> all the time. It's great TV. Don't get me wrong, so TV is great. But I think it was just more you know. Uh, it fast it, it's more interesting to me yeah so you were you were you must have been the perfect candidate at that time to bring that mix of skills you had that in-depth hands-on film experience and all of the the most modern digital technologies and stuff so yeah if i can imagine they looked at you and said this is the perfect person to come and transform this operation that must have been fun it was a lot of fun and it was that just incredibly and and not only working with amazing colleagues at the BFI who I'm also still very close to and still call for you know like my colleague Charles Farrell who was much more in the he was a television engineer and um we used to have these debates all the time you know it was sort of film versus television you know cuz they used mm. to be very separate technologically right right now they're not right, right? And so yeah, just sort yeah. of arguing over approaches of preservation, things like that. They were great. They were, they were good arguments. Mm -hmm. And I still will call them up and argue with them. <laughs> uh, so that's, hopefully there's, that's hopefully great... there's some hellos before the argument starts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. We're great, 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 great yeah. friends. Wonderful friends. You know, I respect them enormously. So they're always very, you know, fruitful. Yeah. Fru fruitful arguments. That's great. Um, so, you know, so, and also just being... Um, in Europe was great too, because there were lots of, uh, cause that was before Brexit. So <laughs> the <laughs> UK was still involved with, yep. yeah. So with European initiatives. And so, for example, I got involved with, uh, there was a European metadata standard for cinematographic works. And, um, so, you know, it, and so I got to be involved with that and worked with people from Germany, France, the Netherlands, you know, on putting together um, a, a metadata standard for for film, which then got implemented and um, required by any EU funding, and and still stands today. So that was great too to be involved with those kinds of things and and learn a lot from really really smart people across Europe as well. So yeah, so it was not it was it was both learning from colleagues in the UK and, and being involved with. Uh, you know, a, a sort of different approach to, <clears throat> or or a, a, a rigorous approach, yeah. I would say, because European archives are really um, their client is their government, right? Mm. Because um, European films and television programs are often um, funded by the government. That you know, there's just there's sort of there's a closeness mm -hmm. to the archives and their funding agencies from the government. That means in a way, additional rigor, mm. right? You have to prove that what you're doing is really good. They take it seriously. So that was a great education as well yeah. in being in that environment yeah. and how to 
really be rigorous about justifying what you're doing with an archive, transparency about what you're doing, you know, how to make sure that what you're doing really makes sense and um, is both, you know, obviously costs are an issue, but also, you know, what you're doing is absolutely the best or the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, people would research that intensely. You know, we, we, we built a whole new vault while I was there and, you know, to, and that was a 25 million pound, you know, investment to build a cold vault meant we, we went into, you know, intense, it was like a five year project of getting yeah, that's a big deal. experts from around the world to say, why is this temperature and humidity the right one? Um, lots of different, so, but getting that. It, that that's what uh, I really appreciated that exercise because yeah. it it gave me more expertise and it and it and it taught me how how to be uh, rigorous um, and and do it well. If we fast forward to today, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing today? So I, I came back and when I uh, was uh, heard about the job at Paramount Pictures, and I was always interested in working in a Hollywood studio. Uh, I thought that would be, you know, and be the the archivist for a Hollywood studio was always interesting to me, and so when that when that job came up, I was definitely interested and came back to that. And so, and I've been there for fifteen years, and um, which seems amazing to me. And that's it's just been an incredible experience because we had the support of an incredible executive team that also took it seriously. Yeah. So you know we you know we did a launched a preservation program. We built out a digital preservation infrastructure. Um, we're now working really hard on how, you know, AI and ML can provide discovery to our assets. Um, so, you know, it just gave me the opportunity to do a really good job yeah. um, and have great colleagues too that are have made the archive great. The other great thing about Paramount Pictures Archive is that Everything's under one roof. Different studios will have an archive here, an archive there, but we have stills, props, costumes, music, all the film and tape, all under one place. Yeah. And and more recently, now that we are Paramount Global, um, I've also started taking on um, CBS archives and the Viacom brand archives. So expanding that a little bit more okay so that's why <clears throat> i'm hoarse <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work yeah yeah um, but that but it's all good it's all great it's all you know finding ways to um preserve and make accessible all these incredible um uh films and television programs you have digital asset management is in your title i i, I from this conversation i would think that you probably like we do for this podcast and the work that we do use a pretty broad interpretation or definition of digital asset management to encompass digital asset, what people traditionally think of as digital asset management, but also digital preservation and digital collections management and those sorts of activities as well. Is that right? Yeah. I think, um, digital asset management, asset management is in my title. Um, you know, and actually, you know, it, I sort of go back and forth between asset management and archives because it is sort of, you know, that's a way to describe. But I think within the, that phrase, digital asset management, I think what what I interpret that as, and I think that means is that you take seriously the fact that you have digital assets, whether it's in a moving image, an image, you know, a document, whatever it is, and you have thought very seriously about how you're going to make sure that those are around and accessible to your clients, you know, and your clients can be anybody, right? Depending on what kind of organization you are. An archive is never its own thing. It's always has a client. My client now is the corporation, right? The, the people that work for um, Paramount Global and all the business units, whether it's home media or marketing or theatrical, those are my clients, yeah. right? When I was in BFI, my clients wouldn't have been the British public, right? You know, so, but every, but you need to make sure that your digital asset management system is serving your clients. So it's, so it's digital preservation is part of that in, in Paramount Pictures because we continue to distribute 
our films over and over right. and over and over again. Right. 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 So we will hopefully be distributing Godfather for another hundred years. Right. So right. Yeah. Paramount Pictures wants to leverage those assets for as long as possible. We will. Yeah. So making sure that preservation is part of it is serving my clients as well as providing access. So that's, you know, so yes, the, the software, the hardware, the, the functionality, everything that goes into digital asset management is, is driven by what, what that archive's role is within their organization. I want to talk a little bit about, you've got a theory, uh, I'll call it a theory, I don't know if you would call it a theory, around the relationship between library science and rocket science that I think would be interesting to interject here before we jump in. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, be, because as we talked about earlier, my experience at UCLA Film and TV Archive and seeing the brilliant minds of Martha Yee, and uh, and her team to actually figure out how to create an inventory system for moving image archives and how to really categorize different types of materials. I mean, this was, you know, um, this was before any of the protocols that are out there now that people can follow, right? That people do follow for making sure that they're using the right metadata schema or thinking about what things are considered preservation assets versus reference assets. None of that was, there was no, there was no blueprint for that. Yeah. Right. And um, so being around that and knowing that that came from intense research into library science, you know, Martha, Yee had a PhD in library science and other things like that, 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 that background of the people that first, figured out that card catalogs were going to go away if <laughs> we needed a computer-based system and how to classify things and how to work things. That, that's such an important part of the history of technology when it comes to digital asset management Yeah, that, you know, and I, I just think it gets, doesn't get as much love as it should. Mm. So that's why I talk about <clears throat> library sites and rocket sites must work together because I think we, we think about sort of the, the cool stuff, the, the latest, you know, video format or other, you know, sort of cool technology advances, which are there, not not short drifting them, mm -hmm. but, you know, to just, you know, pay homage to incredibly hard work of lots of library scientists that have gone before us to, to figure out how to, to build good digital asset management systems is that that's what I that's what I mean yeah. by that. Thanks for that. I want to maybe we can touch on terminology real quick. Um, you 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 have used the term moving image. Uh, we will talk about there's there's terminology used in the forums website around cinematic holdings. Uh, we've talked about film. We've talked about video. I'd like to parse those a, a little bit, or maybe put some definition around them so that folks listening understand what we're talking about. So when we talk about moving image, we're talking about anything with a moving image, video or film. Uh, tell me, tell me if you disagree with any of this. Yeah, no, that's right. It's a catch-all for for anything that moves. Right. right? So the association <laughs> of moving image archivists is a catch-all for all of those things. Right. Uh, the one that I wanted to ask you about was c cinematic holdings. Should we think about that as all film? Should we think about that as film only produced with the intention of being going through like cinema, a commercial cinema sort of thing? Or how do you think when you talk about cinematic holdings, how do you think about that? Good question. I mean, I think, yeah, it, it's, is your question is basically, does it mean that um, the film is only, is something that actually gets released in a the theater? And I think that's increasingly not true anymore, right? Uh, because of streaming. But also, <coughs> for example, one of the things that um, when I got to the BFI that was amazing, they had discovered was these um, early portrait photographers had gone to factory gates and other places where people would come in and set up a camera and then held up a sign and said, come and see yourself on the screen later. And then they would go to a church or a, a, a hall of some sort and show these back. Now, that's not a proper theater, mm -hmm. but I would argue that's cinema, you know, so... Um, it's, you know, yes, I do think that there is a, um, you know, so it, a, it's getting closer and closer. Like what is a, what is the difference between a, a movie and a TV show now? Very hard to, to differentiate. Um, so, but I think that, you know, cinematic holdings 
it would still have relevance. You know, there's there are the obvious ones, feature films or films that were distributed in theaters. And then there's other things like documentaries or other things that were one piece that are, are filmic. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the work that I've done with the Academy <coughs> is based on the fact that the Academy is, is about film. It's about cinema. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, deal with television. Um, and so even though those, those things are melding and becoming closer and closer together, I think there's still, there's a difference. Yeah. Is it, is it fair to say that to the extent that there is a distinction between film and cinematic holdings, that the work of the digital preservation forum is, you know, all, if not a hundred percent, then 99% relevant to anybody with film and m other moving image holdings, or is that an inaccurate statement? Yeah, I mean, we're highly aware that, you know, especially when we're dealing with digital preservation and the technology associated with it, that, you know, the, the kinds of things that we're talking about could absolutely apply to things that were in episodes as well as a long form, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody's trying to fool themselves that it's it's only about things that call themselves cinema. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what you know, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is is mostly focused on, right? Right. So that and that's who's sponsoring that. But yeah, makes sense. You know, there is, you know, there is we've had several conversations with the Television Academy, right? Mm -hmm. They have a similar group, a science and technology council. And so, you know, I could see, you know, one day where there's a much more high collaboration between the two around digital preservation. Yeah. Because yeah, that the, the concepts uh, definitely overlap. Are you liking this episode? It would mean a lot if you let us know by rating and subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. Looking for amazing and free resources to help you on your damn journey? Let the best damn consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. And stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the damn right podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash c Lysinic. I've kind of jumped the gun a bit because I've started to talk about the form already. Would you, I guess, let's just say that you are the project co-chair of the Academy Digital Preservation Forum. Um, given the background we just heard, that makes all the sense in the world. Uh, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you came to be the co-chair and, and tell us a bit about the work of the forum. Yeah. So I, uh, I was on this, when, when I got to be a member of the Academy, um, I was accepted as a member of the Science and Technology Council. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to be part of that council was I wanted to advance the concept of digital preservation, have it taken more seriously. The, the Academy out of that council had produced the digital dilemma back in, I think it was 2007, 2008, something like that. And, you know, it was, it was the first step, but it also said that <clears throat> it was really expensive to do digital preservation and, you know, we weren't ready yet. And, and I thought we needed a better message. Mm -hmm. So that was really my mission was to say, you know, actually, you know, lots of people are working on digital preservation and it is possible and we need to make sure that we're talking about it well. Yeah. And so that's that. That was really my mission by joining the SciTech Council. And so, uh, the um, the committee, uh, which I think was like Digital Preservation Committee or something like that, came up with the idea. We were going to do a, a big event, um, and then follow that up with a website. But then COVID happened, and then we so we focused on the website first. And so the website really is it is a forum. It is a place for people to go. And there is a area on the website where you anyone could post anything, have discussions and things like that. That is the purpose of it, yeah. to understand that there are real complexities when it comes to digital preservation, to have a place where people can watch some videos about different topics around digital preservation, to comment, to add new articles, to however they are, to have a place where whoever you are, <clears throat> even though it's very much, you know, from, um, sort of an academy standpoint. So entertainment industry based, cinema based, still, I think it's open enough for anybody that's interested in digital preservation, especially in moving images and digital preservation in general, to have a place to go and learn more and hopefully, you know, sort of talk amongst themselves, talk 
train each other on how what the best practices are yeah. so that we can continue you know to have good good digital preservation of of so many movies that are created digitally that are really great works of art that need that kind of attention the the background that we, when you talked about your background and you've just touched on the digital dilemma report that came out i think it was 2007 2008 like you said um you have there's been this you've you've touched on the term photochemical a number of times um and and what we haven't quite said out loud explicitly yet is that there was this and what was going on back in 2007 was this uh, uh tension uh anxiety around um a move away from film as the the preservation format for film uh to digital and i wonder if you could just give us a background around that. So maybe tell, you know, for folks that aren't acquainted with film, you know, maybe just explain a little bit more when you say photochemical, what you mean. And then could you give us a, a brief history of like how that's evolved and where we are today with the film versus digital on the preservation front? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, it, it takes me back to, you know, um, when I first worked at UCLA and we had this rallying cry, nitrate won't wait, right? You know, mm nitrate was going to deteriorate before the year 2000 and we had to copy it all before it all just disappeared into the ether um and so dutifully many archives did put it onto acetate film which then we discovered also deteriorates really quickly um but you know it, it's interesting like that time was film was it wasn't really a trustworthy source in a way, you know, that, that, that could deteriorate. That was scary. Fast forward to now where film is like, that's the answer, right? Mm. It's still people, the people are now suspicious, very suspicious of digital. And so I hear this all the time. Like why just, why just preserve it on film? What's your problem? Um, you know, that's work. That's, a, that's the archival standard. That's what we should do. Um, and you know, I just don't think it's that simple. Um, you know, there's, for, you know, my, my, for example, you know, audio, um, there, there's not really, um, that well of the great of a way to preserve audio that's digital onto some sort of photochemical format anymore. Mm. Right. That just, that's, that technology is starting to it is, it's sunset it mag isn't made anymore. It's not there anymore or, or things that are really inherently digital, like effects, um, that need to be treated digitally. Um, and so I think that that feeling, it's something that I always encounter and, and, and a lot of people will push back on that. Um, you know, I remember sitting in the room with um, the then president of the Academy, John Bailey, who said out loud, you know, isn't digital preservation an oxymoron? Hmm. So th there's always been this very big, concern that digital is not trustworthy for the long term, that, you know, it's going to go into the ether and things like that. And that's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges for digital preservation. How can you be a trustworthy guardian of assets in your, in your asset management system? And I, and I know it's, um, it's something that all, you know, that all of us have to, to manage on an ongoing basis because it's, it's not, you know, I think there's, you, there's a perception that you put a piece of film on a shelf and everything's fine. Well, actually, that's not necessarily true. You still have to have a really good vault. You have to maintain that vault. You have to make sure that you recan that film, possibly occasionally. You have to have archivists to make sure your inventory is okay. It's not without its own maintenance. Same with, and with digital, it, it is more complicated. There's a lot more, but it's I think it's it's the unknown and not knowing and not enough people knowing how to really dig in and insist with their technology partners to to put this functionality in, et cetera. When we did our digital preservation infrastructure at Paramount, I had a lot of, of again, good battles and arguments mm -hmm. with the infrastructure team, the people that oversaw a network and <coughs> excuse me, and storage because I wanted to know where within that storage system that asset lived within my digital asset management system. Yeah. And I wanted to set up 
annual health checks automatically. And that involved people that dealt with infrastructure systems that were really opaque Mm -hmm. and asking them to make them more transparent and inside a digital asset management system was something new to them. Yeah. So I think that's part of it as well is that it's that uh, understanding of what you need for a digital asset management system to make it trustworthy, to make it robust. I think the more people become educated by that and frankly, the the younger the colleagues are in this space, mm-hmm. I think that will become more of a and it already has. Yeah. There's already plenty of really smart people doing this in our in our field. Yeah. Um so I think that's the that may be the tension about photochemical versus digital, but it still exists. It hasn't, mm-hmm. it's still a concern and it still is there. And, you know, and, and it, 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 this, this binary approach of either or is the other silly part of it, right? I love film. I built, I built two great film vaults that are the best they can be mm-hmm. so that I can preserve that original film. I love seeing a beautiful print made in ideal conditions, you know? My my passion and my affection for film is alive. Right. Just because I, you know, like digital preservation and also appreciate films that were made digitally doesn't mean I started hating film. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so I think that's the other thing is sometimes it, people, it, that either or thing. Right, right. Is, you uh, have to hold two thoughts in your head at the same time. Yeah, yeah like, yeah, yeah, we can do that, you right, know. Right, right. And, um, so I think that it's interesting. And um, so it's something that it's just an ongoing, it's, it's awareness, it's understanding. And I think it's trust too. trust in archivists and institutions to handle digital objects yeah. well. And, um, and maybe we need to do a better job at showing that it's possible and it's done every day across tons of industries um, you know, maybe that's our maybe that's our job in this space to show we are trustworthy repository um, advocates. So, is is Paramount Pictures an aberration in the entertainment industry as far as the embracing of digital preservation, or or is that the norm these days? Not at all. No, and and that's what's one of the wonderful things about um, building up the site, the Academy Digital Preservation Forum, was I decided to you know as want to build a site who's going to have content and who was going to be my sort of editorial board for that content. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I assembled people from Warner brothers, Sony Fox, now Disney um, to be that group of people. We called it the curatorial working group. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're all listed on the site. Um, so I would bring these topics to that group. Um, it was one of my, the best parts of the pandemic. It was like every Friday we had these discussions <laughs> about, great. you know, and it was, it was this chance for us to really discuss these issues between ourselves and, and show that the, across that, that group, the sort of studio group, that there were a lot of really best practices. There were a lot of things that people were really taking seriously yeah. um, about digital preservation. So, it, you know, and that was, so that's what the site also represents yeah. is that, collective um thinking and considered approach to digital preservation i can see that being useful for sure uh, let's t- t- sidebar on another kind of terminological thing here i think i use the term entertainment industry <clears throat> how do you think about who the entertainment industry is today when i think about it from my perspective you're obviously in it I, I, as a as a, i'll call myself an outsider I, the blurring of lines between both the you know entertainment industry versus big tech and as well as just like the 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 blooming of the inter- entertainment in- industry across the globe right it used to we used to think of entertainment industry really being hollywood centric now there's major cinematic uh industries throughout the world how how do you think about who the the entertainment industry is today i mean uh, first and foremost i think that you know the sort of the the traditional studios, the big studios have definitely been challenged by the streaming services, right? By Netflix and Amazon and now Apple. And so that's the biggest challenge to that model, Mm. right? And that's, they are definitely part of the entertainment industry now. So that, 
is where that it's definitely that's where our entertainment is funded and made and those you know that's that is you know sort of the biggest industry just in terms of sheer output mm-hmm. right that those streaming services have met the studios at that level um you know so that's that's one part but yes there's there's every country has you know some sort of entertainment industry of their own right so um that's the other wider part is that um you know we know more and more about uh you know international uh output than we ever had before which is exciting right we're not we're not in a, a world where American entertainment industry is the only industry anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's the other part of it, the global. And then beyond that, of course, there's people that are um, creating entertainment every day on their cell phones, right? You could mm-hmm. say, you could argue that, that sort of, you know, Web 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, whatever entertainment industry, right? Of mm-hmm. TikTok and Instagram and um, everything like that. That's arguably an industry in and of itself sure. so um so it's you know yeah it's it's certainly not the big five studios making movies and everybody else has to bow down anymore at all you know it's yeah. changed massively let me ask another question that kind of dives into maybe more the traditional big five or you know traditional entertainment industry in in my experience what i've seen and this is i'm thinking here about kind of the distinction between rights holders and ownership versus who holds the physical materials or digital materials on their servers. Um, What I've seen is that through mergers and acquisitions, transfer and ownership of collections, uh, that oftentimes the physical materials may have never actually gotten inventoried and moved. So something that's owned by one entity A over here who is leveraging their ownership, making their licensing it out, the physical materials or the digital files may live still at the previous entity who held it. And, and it seems like in in a lot of ways, those business, there's just been a collegiality. Hey, oh, we have this thing. You know, do you have it? Can you send it to us? That has made that OK. It hasn't been, uh, you know, in the short term for the purpose of doing business. That seems to be OK. But when you think about digital, well, preservation period, whether it be digital or physical, that seems problematic. And I don't know, you know, is that is that problem so small as to be negligible or is that a larger problem that that exists out there that that has to be grappled with? It's really interesting because sometimes I think, OK, when the, all the world's archives are digitized, right, and perhaps they're, you know, sort of available in the cloud or on some sort of on-prem server storage that, you know, you can really just hand the keys over, right? You don't have to move the assets right. anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um and yet we do, we do move, we do, you know, um, Paramount had Marvel for a while, you know, when Disney purchased Marvel, we went through an enormous project of, you know, identifying all inventory and moving all inventory, digital and physical over to Disney. You know, um, I have a binder like this thick of everything we, you know, went through to do that. So it does, it still does matter that where, where your holdings are. But to your point, too, of, you know, other material, different libraries owned by different companies, it doesn't make sense. You know, the Paramount movies made between 1929 and 1949 are with Universal. Paramount owns the Republic Library. You know, Warner Brothers has RKO and Mm. uh, early MGM. So there's, you know, different library acquisitions make it a little more complicated, too. Yeah. Um, But, uh, yeah, I still, I think, you know, I've not worked with people. I've always known that we, we get the materials when we need to distribute them. I, I, I've not had that experience that you're talking about. I don't want to start spreading rumors here. Maybe I'm... <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine. I'm, I'm sure it happens. Yeah. It's just not been my experience. Okay. Uh, I guess that just made me think about like the... I, I, the that this term about entities that have cinematic holdings may have cinematic holdings that they, you know, a part impartial or at whole may or may not have rights to actually leverage, which brings in like the business angle, right? And I guess I wonder, you've given us some great insights into the complexities around some of the technical things around digital preservation, but what the forum makes clear, and I think what those digital dilemma made clear, and at the same time, there was the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Digital Preservation, Digital Preservation, Sustainability and Access, something like that. Um, they all focused on the business side as being like, I think, 
maybe the main driver. And I wonder, what's your assessment of, of what the business complexity looks like with regard to digital preservation? You've touched on it a bit, but can you give us, in the same way you've given us some insights into the technical complexities, like what does the business side look like of digital preservation? Well, so, you know, again, I look at what's my role, right? So my role as an archive for Paramount is to make sure that I'm preserving the materials for which we have what I call substantial rights. That's my phrase. I made it up. Um, and so that means if there we have rights worldwide in perpetuity, all media, then that's a movie I'm going to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, if we have rights in the U.S. only, but it's also forever, yeah, that's worth it. Because my company, you know, can benefit from that long-term holding of that physical, of that materials, right? So, um, so we might uh, acquire something for two years and distribute it, and then it goes back to a rights holder. I'm not going to preserve that. Um, that's somebody else's property, mm -hmm, right? right? So it really is based on, on ownership. Um, and I do think, you know, and that's, um, that, that's where my focus is. And I feel that's an obligation of rights holders too, mm -hmm. to look after the materials they preserve and restore, which doesn't always happen. Um, you know, and, and there are of course, not for profit archives that hold materials for which they don't own the rights and that collaboration between rights owner and, you know, and nonprofit archive is, you know, usually good can be fraught, you know, that that's another part of this, this project as well. I mean, we're Paramount gave the Library of Congress silent films back in the 60s and 70s because there was no concept of an mm. archive, right? Um, and so, you know, that that history plays into that, right? When did we start start actually caring about archives? Maybe a little too late, yeah. right? So those are those are complexities of the business too, where there wasn't the funding, there wasn't the interest in taking care of archives because the business wouldn't take care of it. That's part of the equation as well. From your perspective, what's the bigger challenge, technology uh, or or finance or business? I mean, I think no matter where you are, whether you're in a, a studio or you're in a non, not for profit archive, and I've worked in both, right? You know, um, the phrase everyone loves an archive until they have to pay for it applies, <laughs> right? So, you know, if you need, if you have, you, you need the technology and you need to pay for the technology. Um, you need the vaults and you need to pay for the vaults. You need the staff and you need to pay for the staff. So, you know, figuring out how to make sure you're making the best case for the archive is probably always the biggest challenge. Yeah. And I, you know, when I, when I talk to people at, you know, um, in, in university classes, you know, I say, if, if you don't like advocacy, you may want to pick another field, <laughs> right? If you don't want. Yeah, uh, because if you don't if you don't feel like you're if if you want to just sit somewhere and catalog something and everybody's going to leave you alone, you know that may be your perception of archiving. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you constantly have to think. Okay, um, let me. Well, I'm talking to this person. I'm going to cl collect this use case so that when I'm up against my finance person, I can say this is why I'm doing this because this makes money or this helps our marketing or this does this. You know, so you have to constantly be looking at all right. Um, can, can we do it this way? Can we do it this way? Is this cheaper? If we, if we save some money here, can we spend it there? And that always, 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 that's a big part of the archival project is right. making sure you're speaking well about the importance of what you're doing. Um, you know, i I'm sure that my finance people are, are tired of hearing me saying, well, if we don't have that asset, the revenue would be zero. <laughs> Good you argument. Know? Good argument. I'm sure they're sick of hearing sick of hearing me say that, right? But that's that's the you know, no matter where how you're going to implement your archive strategy with technology or physical vaults or whatever it is, it's about advocating for why you should do it. That's a perfect segue to the next question I have for you, which is kind of about the why. So we talked about. You, you pointed out, you know, Paramount Pictures has a, an interest in preserving The Godfather because they want to monetize it 100 years from now, too, right? This is an asset that they want to continue to monetize, and that makes perfect sense. But could you give us a fuller picture of the why? Why is it important? Uh, you know, and let's just focus on the cinematic holdings of the 
organizations that are in the digital preservation form, as an example, um, and not that you speak on behalf of all of them, but from your perspective, like why is it important other than the long-term monetization argument to preserve these holdings? Look, I think I think anybody in any entertainment organization would would recognize that there's a cultural aspect to it too that you you do have within your holdings. Um, you know, I, I do think that movies are the greatest art form ever created. You know, they have it all. They have music, they have art, they have cinematography. There's, you know, I do think that there is an understanding that there's a cultural responsibility, even within a business, right? Uh, that may be easier for a not-for-profit to talk about as part of their advocacy thing. Within a business, that could be a little trickier, right? Because they're always just about the bottom line. But I do think that that's, that there's, there's that part of it. And I think that, you know, and one of the things I always sort of get called, you know, in on is historical aspects of the studio, right? So um, that it becomes relevant for marketing or for our corporate uh, branding concepts mm -hmm. or just generally talking about where, where Paramount Pictures comes from, where does it fit in the history of the entertainment industry, what, you know, how these things happen. And I think that that part of it. And that's that's something similar that you see across corporate archives generally, right? Whether you work for Coca-Cola or Ford or, you know, uh, there's other, you know, big corporate archives that realize that that legacy of how they've built their business and the, the products or the, the things that they've created have enormous, you know, sort of um, relevance to their corporate brand and their corporate identity, but also are really interesting things to preserve among themselves. You know, I remember seeing, you know, uh, uh, my colleague at, at, at Ford, you know, some of the incredible designs for cars that have been done by these amazing designers over the years and, you know, fantastic. Why would you throw that out? That's so important. Yeah. Um, and I think people feel that way too, within businesses to, to see that, 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 contribution that that company made that intervention in culture that intervention in innovation is is remembered yeah uh so that's another part of it should we trust the entertainment industry to bear that burden or you know take that on to be those the stewards of preserving these culturally important materials yeah no i think it's a good question you know i think you know when i first started working at ucla film and tv archive you know, the studios were the baddies, mm. you know, they were the ones that let things not be taken care of. I mean, the UCLA Film and TV Archive was started because um, Paramount was getting rid of a lot of nitrate film because it was going to be illegal to keep it on the lot, mm. you know. For those who don't know, maybe we should tell people why that was. <laughs> you mentioned nitrate earlier. But... So, yeah, so nitrate, nitrate-based film, uh, film stock made, used very much before 1950 well, everywhere every film was made out of it is also really highly flammable um and so requires very significant uh vault and you know care very special care of that material okay, so that's why it was not allowed on the lot it was, it was a fire risk right it was a fire risk so um and ucla went and like literally picked up all the nitrate and 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 took care of it so that's how in you know so that history of studios not caring is is going to be with us forever, mm. right? I think you know we've definitely turned the tide on that and made it, you know uh, obviously there's there's great restorations coming out of all the studios right now. Every studio built has built vaults. Um, every studio is now really engaged with digital preservation. So I think there's definitely been a switch, a major switch through the from those days. Um, but you know it's a it's a legacy that's it's hard to beat. Right. It's a legacy that is not proud. There's all, you know, there's a lot of silent films that are stored in the Santa Monica Bay, mm. you know, um, so that that's hard to get over. Yeah. And I think that's the other reason for that. Another sort of impetus of the Academy Digital Preservation Forum is let's 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 turn that on its head a little bit. Yeah. So the so the Academy clearly has taken on some responsibility by giving a home to the Digital Preservation Forum. What do you think the. Is there a larger role for the Academy to play in the digital preservation or supporting or leading uh, thought leadership of any sort? Is, is the forum the manifestation of that or is there something bigger, do you think? I mean, the Academy is not a standards body, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not going to insist 
that the entertainment industry follow a particular model for digital preservation. That's just not their role. They don't see it as their role, you know, and I can't speak completely for the Academy, sure. you know, a, I'm an Academy member that's on the SciTech Council doing something I think is, you know, is important for, uh, for film archives. Right. So, um, and that's, that's great that the Academy lets its members do that. Right. They, they, they're, they're giving, letting the members have a voice in some of the important issues of the day, whether it's, you know, um, talking about diversity and inclusion, members are very important, you know, including that they're giving them a voice that way, mm -hmm. or whether it's, you know, they had a big conference on AI and ML recently that crosses all the branches, giving them a voice. So that's what the Academy really does well, I think, is not insist on do it the Academy way, mm -hmm. but say, we've got all these smart members, they have a clue. Uh, let's allow them to help by, you know, um, giving them that, that ability. Yeah. So that's the role I think the Academy plays really well. Who makes up the, the, the folks that are on the, I mean, the forum itself, I think is open to, is it open to the public as far as who can engage on the, the forum? Yeah. But there's a, there's a working group or a group of contributors that are listed on the site under our team. Who is the makeup of that group? How did they? How did the group come to be formed? And I guess just I'm just trying to wonder, like, what are the skills, the expertise, the breadth of experience that is that's on the team there? So mostly, it's what I talked about earlier, right? When I decided that you know, out of so there's a small working group that are uh, SciTech Council members and and others that are interested, um, but you know, for that that curatorial working group I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, which are people from the different studios that are in roles similar to myself that meet regularly and talk about the issues of digital preservation and decide where we're going and what things we want to tackle. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it is, is, is trying to collect up, um, you know, the, the people that are dealing or on the front lines of this yeah. um, and, and have them be the people that are vetting ideas that would go to the forum to, what's important to talk about what what should we do what what video should we shoot next to put up there yeah. what's what's critical about what we're we're thinking about if you fast forwarded you're you're at a dinner with your colleagues on the forum and and you're you're toasting to the successes of the forum i guess what's your what's your hopes your dreams what have you accomplished at the point at which you say yes we've done it you know cheers what what do you think the forum can accomplish you know, I think I, I still feel like we have a lot to do. I feel like we've just started. I feel like there's, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, I, I still, you know, I think people are still scratching their heads like, what is digital preservation? Mm. I don't get it. You know, I don't know if we've really, had this. I feel like we still have loads, so much work to do. Mm. It, I think there's great stuff on the forum for people to learn from, you know, um, but it's complicated. There's not this one answer of, for digital preservation, you just have to flip the switch and you're done, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's – so a complex message is always a difficult one to get across, yeah. right? And so how we – you know, success for me would mean that uh, digital asset management systems would have digital preservation baked into them no matter where they were. Mm. They don't right now. Right. That'd be great. If you bought a digital asset management system off the shelf, you would always know you would have a protocol that would make sure your assets were preserved. That would be success. That would be one version of success yeah. for me. Yeah. Right. Or that, you know, or everybody that's ever making a moving image has a plan for how they're going to make sure that those assets are replicated, that they are validated annually, that you can find them easily. You know, that, that if everybody had a plan to do that, that would look like success. I think we still have a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, digital preservation, I think, is dece deceitful in the sense that it is so simple in many ways and so complicated in others, right? I mean, the basics, the fundamentals on the technological side are pretty straightforward. I think there's some strong basic business arguments for why it makes sense. You laid out many of those today. There's cultural reasons, but it, is, it does get really complex really quickly when you dive into the details. So, yeah. How, how important is it that the major players... Uh, in in the let's say the studios the holders of cinematic collections do essentially the same thing with regard to their outputs obviously they're gonna have different workflows there's going to be different little nitty-gritty details that are 
going to be different. And that doesn't matter much. But file format choices, uh, maybe the maybe digitization technology. How important is it that that's similar or not? I think you know the way that if, if people can do things more in a more similar way, what's helpful about that is it's not as confusing. You know, um, for example, one of the things we're working on right now is this concept of a, what's called a picture preservation package, right? So at the end of a film, um, when you're going through, when you're working with a post house, they output what we can be called a digital intermediate. Well, now there's all sorts of different names for these different versions of digital intermediates, NAMs, GAMs, consolidated archives, all these different kinds of things. And so both post-production people who are finishing the film as well as the, the facilities where they're being done, it's like, oh, God, why can't they decide on one thing? You know, why are there all these different versions and I have to make this for this studio and that for this studio and that, you know, so that's confusing and it, it could mean more mistakes are made or it's not done well. So if there's a similar process, I think that helps everybody. Everybody can just point to it and go, that's what I want. Please do that. And if we can also make that easy to be created by working with some of the software vendors that create the DIs, then it's allowing people to make preservation assets a little easier and mm. there's more po potential for them to be made. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, it's not, it's not a standard. It's not insisting anything. It's just like, here's something. If we could all agree on this, make it out, you know. And you, you've just touched on something there that's, that I think is interesting. And from my perspective, you know, I, I'm not, I work, I work with lots of media and, in, media and entertainment folks, but I'm, it's not what I do all day, every day. So I, I work with a lot of different verticals. So what I see is that, I mean, you talked about vendors and that just made me think, my observation has been that there is a closer collaboration between archives, digital asset holders of content and digital assets and and vendors in the media and entertainment world than there is other places. Uh, I don't know if you can comment on whether that's true or not. You've been in a variety of verticals too, but I guess I wonder like wh how do you see that relationship fostering the event the, the ultimate goal of digital preservation? And it's like anything else within, you know, uh, a business, right? Sometimes you want to do it internally, sometimes you want to outsource it, right? So um, and people outsource all sorts of different things. Some people um, outsource their entire media supply chain to, you know, a company. Um, like when they're finished with it, they hand it over to somebody to make sure it gets out to all the different final clients that it needs to get out to. Mm -hmm. It can form all the languages. They do all that work. Um, other people don't. Other people do it in-house. Um, certainly within feature film and television production, you know, the the post house is almost you know is is almost always an outside vendor and they have you know they might have colorists that the the director prefers um that's very important to maintain that relationship or mm -hmm. um they might you know they might have a very so yes that integration between different vendors and there's certain things that we can't it, it would be difficult for us to to in source too like People that do localization, you know, they have linguists um, all over the world and things like that. So there's, there's there's some work that's impossible for everybody to take in house. I mean, that's constantly being looked at and revised, right? Yeah. And technology is a big part of that, right? If you can do it mm -hmm. simpler, and there's technology that makes things not as complicated as it used to be, then it's constantly going back and forth. So I think. Um, but yeah, there's, and, and there's also outsourcing of archives too. So, you know, there's, yeah. uh, you know, people will, will, will have a vendor that will do digital preservation for them. Right. So yeah. that's another possibility. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's part of the, you know, uh, the landscape generally, I would say. They are an important stakeholder at the table in the conversation, it seems. Yeah, they are. They are, um, yeah. And when I look at when I look at the list of folks that are on the curatorial working group, and you have folks listed as additional contributors, I mean, it seems like you've got, you know, we've touched on finance. It seems like you've got people that are executives. You've got people that are technology centric. You've got, uh, I think it's fair to say, some vendors. I don't know if that's a accurate assessment or not. Is folks that yeah, are there's not as many vendors as there could be, and that's a discussion too. And it's it's kind of tricky with the academy because they don't they want they don't want to 
be shown as, you know, supporting one sure. you know, business sure. over sure. another. Sure. So that's, that's a tricky part. But, you know, if we had a, uh, an event, which we're talking about doing right now, then that would be definitely, you know, uh, one topic that I would love to have is like more people from post houses really having, because there's really smart, great people with all sorts of great innovations going on all the time, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and so they're part of the conversation. Absolutely. Switching a little bit, I guess I wonder, should people think about this being a U.S. centric thing or or is this a global uh, endeavor the forum, that is. I mean, I think, you know, because it's the Academy, it's because it's Los Angeles, because it's traditionally tied to the studios, it's definitely been U.S. in its concept now. Although we did have, um, you know, we, there are other members of the Academy that are now coming in. Um, but there's uh, on, on, the, on the group right now is somebody from India, somebody from the Netherlands. So there, you know, we are, you know, it's that's a bias, but it's not exclusive. Yeah. Um, trying to get um, a, a wider... Uh, perspective on it is absolutely essential. Um, and, you know, yeah, I would love to see um, it, that, that, that's our, our, that's our biggest um, challenge right now is how do we get more involvement, mm. right? How do we, you know, we can't invite everybody into a curatorial working group, right? We want to focus them on the forum, but how do they, how do we get people interested and engaged and active in that? That's what we set it up for. Yeah. Right. So it could be wider. It could be a broader group. And that's our, you know, it's part, partly why I'm doing this podcast is to get the word out about it. Um, you know, cause that's why we want people, we want everybody's input. We want to hear what we're doing, right. What we're doing wrong. What can we do better? You know, um, how can we, what other issues are we not thinking about? So we want that feedback. So who, who should pay attention to the forum? Is it, it sounds like it's not, not just, folks with cinematic holdings, not just people in the U.S.? I mean, who 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 do you think that the content and the subject matter is relevant for? I mean, I would love to see, you know, ultimately uh, more people that own the purse strings for archives be much more you know, aware of archives. I would love to have the forum reach even up to that level. You know, that would be my ideal. But I think, you know, but obviously filmmakers, um, you know, archivists are an obvious one. Uh, we mentioned vendors like post-production houses. I'd love to see them much more engaged with it. And technologists, people who are building things, right? Like, you know, it, it would be great if, you know, if, if a cloud company came to us and said, hey, we're thinking about how to do digital preservation in the cloud. What do you think? You know, uh, that hasn't happened yet. I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's where I think, you know, that, as broad a possible audience of stakeholders would be amazing. Well, it's it's come to the time where I asked the the final question that I ask all the guests on the Damn Right podcast, which is, what is your what's the last song that you added to your favorites playlist? Uh, <laughs> probably uh, something from seventies funk. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's really where I go all the time. Or disco. Give us one of your favorites. We've got a we've got a podcast playlist that assembles all of these. So just just give us one of your favorites. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Gloria Gaynor. I will survive. All right. Love it. That's a, that's a very suitable song. Love that. That should be the theme song. In the in the realm of preservation, right? I, I love that. <laughs> well, Andrea, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. It's been fascinating. I could talk for two more hours. Uh, I, I want to just dive into just your career path. That's fascinating. That's like so cool. Uh, I I love it that you uh, joined me today. I really appreciate all the insights and, thanks, Chris. and uh, just everything you brought to the table. So thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you, Chris. Thanks for your time. Do you have feedback or requests for the Damn Right podcast? Hit me up and let me know at damnright at weareavp.com. Looking for amazing and free resources to help you on your damn journey? Let the best damn consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. Stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the Damn Right Podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash C Lucinic.